Hi, Vladlin. Hi, Debbie. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Doing great. Thank you for um, agreeing to do this. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so as I think you know, this call um, is being recorded. Um, and so are you, are you ready to get started? Yeah. Um, so I have um, a whole lot of questions. <laughs> and so some of this uh, might feel a little bit like a rapid fire round. Um, some of them are light, so it might not take a lot of thought. Um, some of them might take some more thought. Feel free to pause if you want to. Um, feel free to let me know if you want to skip a question. Um, so all of that is fine. Um, in general, if you can um, err on the side of being more transparent, more vulnerable, I think that would be great that we will get the most out of this. Does this all right. Yeah. All right. We'll try. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my first question is, um, what were you doing just before this call? I grabbed a snack. I had a <laughs> nutritional bar. <laughs> right. Um, what is your daily routine like? I get up early, uh, usually at 5 a.m. Uh, the morning is my most productive time, and that's when I do uh, focused work, like reading or writing. So I usually have uh, at least two or three hours in the morning before meetings start. Um, that's usually 5 to 8 a.m. or 5 to 9 a.m., depending on the time zone I'm in. And that's the time when I do a lot of my technical reading, or if I need to write a paper, if we're, for example, close to a deadline, when we're working on papers and I need to do writing, that is when I do uh, my writing. Mm. I make an effort to not turn on the computer and not check email so as to keep my head uh, absolutely clear. Mm -hmm. So I get up, I make tea or I make an espresso, uh, and usually I sit down to read with my iPad. And the first app I open is, uh, is the, the reading app that I use to read my papers. And usually I do a couple of hours of straight reading. Uh, if I need to write, instead of reading, I, uh, I do my writing. Then usually on weekdays, meetings start. Uh, I have um, a couple of long stretches of meetings uh, with breaks for uh, maybe lunch or working out. Uh, and then it's, uh, it's close, to, close to evening. I sometimes have uh, an hour or two to myself in the evening. Um, I can use that to uh, do some reading. At that point, I'm pretty tired, so I don't do uh, technical reading. Um, I read uh, fiction or, or maybe not fic nonfiction. That's not, that's not my work. Um, or maybe I'll read, uh, I'll read a current affairs magazine, um, or I'll just clear my email and do, uh, and do some work that doesn't require, uh, a clear focused mind, more like routine things that I can do even when I'm, uh, uh, when I'm not fresh. And, um, I'm usually in bed around 9 p.m. So I have to get uh, eight, eight hours. Eight hours, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is your favorite part of your day? It is the early morning. Uh, it is those two, three, or four hours before meetings start. And everything is clear. Everything is quiet. Um, my mind is fresh. Um, I often see the dawn. Uh, I love seeing the dawn. I love uh, how everything gradually wakes up and brightens and there are beautiful colors uh, in the sky. So that is by far my favorite part of the day. Yeah. Um, and what is the least favorite part? It's at the end of a long stretch of meeting. Uh, I 
do get tired. Um, it is often before the lunch break or at the end of the day before, uh, before dinner. At that point, I, I commonly have been through four or five or six back-to-back -back meetings. And you know how there are these studies that show that uh, judges uh, become harsher before <laughs> lunch. And if you are going to have your case heard before a judge, you really want to, to have it heard after lunch rather than before <laughs> lunch because the judge is, is going to be more lenient after lunch. So I do feel, I, I don't think I get harsher, although uh, maybe, maybe I do, but I do get less fresh. Uh, I, I, I feel like, like I am more tired. Um, I, my bet would be that my ideas are, 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 are less good, um, you know, at an 11 a.m. or a noon meeting uh, than at an 8 a.m. Uh, meeting. And it's really not fair, uh, right? It's not fair towards the people I, uh, I work with. It's not fair towards the people I meet with. I hope the effect is not, is not severe. Um, but I, I certainly start feeling, uh, start feeling pretty tired. And that is my least favorite part. Of it. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's an interesting point about it not being fair, because these meetings are often recurring, right? So it's probably the same set of people who always catch you right before lunch or right after lunch. And so it might be interesting to just randomly shuffle it around a little bit every other week or something. Um, that's interesting. Right. Yeah. Right. That's an argument against regular weekly slots, actually. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, what one chore do you dislike the most and why is that? I don't dislike chores because I don't find them burdensome. The chores that would usually come to mind, the, the usual suspects are doing laundry or doing the dishes. But uh, we have washing machines and dryers <laughs> and, and, and dishwashers. So it's just a few minutes. It, it, really, uh, it really doesn't take long. Um, I think of it as basically part of routine maintenance, like, like uh, brushing teeth or having a shower after a workout. It's, it's basically something that's part of life and um, is really not, not bothersome. I do remember a time um, when there were no, when we did not have uh, washing machines and uh, dryers uh, and dishwashers, or for that matter, microwaves and VCRs. And that's not because I'm that old. I am old, but not that old. It's because I, I grew up in the Soviet Union. And when I was growing up, we really didn't have any of those things. In fact, I didn't know uh, such things existed. And I remember members of my family doing laundry um, when there were no washing machines and there were no dryers. And it, it took half a day. It was a whole uh, ordeal that at the end included uh, hanging out the, uh, uh, the, clo the, the clothes, uh, hanging them out to dry on the balcony, on, uh, on, on clothes lines, uh, and so forth. And then you have to take them down the next day and, uh, and, and iron them. That, I think I would resent that. I, I don't think I would like that very much. Right. Right. Um, do you struggle with procrastination? No. Uh, I love what I do. That's, that's the key. I, I, I want to do it. Um, there is basically no procrastination uh, issue because I, I want to do basically what I'm supposed to do. Basically, my job uh, is, is something that I, that I just want to do. Mm -hmm. um, do you struggle with time management? No. Uh, likewise, um, I don't. But I think part of that is that most things that people want me to do, I do not do. Um, I think uh, 
the biggest part of time management is not efficiently packing all the tasks you do and, and scheduling them in a, uh, in a clever way. Really the biggest part is making the binary decisions on which tasks you are going to do, which tasks you are going to take on. So when you get to a certain level, many people will want you to do many things, uh, most of which you don't need to do. Uh, and so really the most important part of time management is just not taking on most things that I could take on, not doing most things that various people want me to do. Um, I don't respond to most email, uh, for example. It, it is what it is. Uh, so with that, with being very strict about that, um, there is no problem doing the things that I do decide to do. Right, right. Makes sense. Um, do you set an alarm in the morning? I do. Every day, including the weekend, um, 5 a.m. or if, uh, if I have to go to bed later, eight hours after, after I go to bed. Hmm. Um, do you hit the snooze button at all? Usually not. Uh, there's usually no need. So if I have a normal, regular routine, um, and I work out, um, and I get my eight hours of sleep, um, then I sleep well, then I get up pretty, uh, pretty fresh. Uh, things get out of whack sometimes when I travel. Um, so obviously when I shift between time zones, uh, things are a bit less reliable, although even there, um, they're usually dialed in pretty well and and in fact it is important uh for man for me for managing jet lag to get up at the right time at the destination that's one of the keys uh to uh, uh to not suffering uh severely from mm -hmm. jet lag so there even if i don't feel <laughs> particularly uh uh, joyful in the morning, <laughs> I, I do get myself out of out of bed because it's important. Because if I don't, it's gonna get even worse. Worse, right, right. Um, if I asked your friends what is Ladlin like, um, what are three adjectives that you think they'd use to describe you? I don't know. I guess you're going to ask <laughs> us. <laughs> I will tell you one thing uh, I've heard them say repeatedly, uh, which is that I am married to my work. Uh, that is the expression that, that has been used uh, on, uh, on various occasions, and uh, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you happy with the number of close friends you have? It is what it is. Uh, it's, uh, it could be fewer, uh, it could be more, um, but then it wouldn't be me. It would be somebody else. It wouldn't be my life. Um, it's fine. I'm generally happy with my life, including this aspect of my life. Right. Um, what is one thing you are worse at than people around you? Uh, I think many things, uh, most of which I'm probably oblivious to and people are too polite to tell me. Um, I'm more on the introverted side. Uh, so in society, in a, in a situation where I'm in a group of people and we're talking, um, that is not the most natural situation uh, for me. That is probably not when I'm uh, in my element. Um, I'm very comfortable one-on-one. -on -one. I really like interacting with people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I'm very comfortable being alone. Um, I'm 
very, very comfortable and content just, uh, just doing my own thing. Um, when I'm in a group of people, let's say a large group of people, let's say a, a cocktail party or a reception, I usually interact with people one-on-one -on -one serially. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll chat with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, then I'll switch and chat with somebody else one-on-one, -on -one, and I'll kind of go through that. But the situation where there is kind of a, a whole group of people talking, uh, and I'm, I'm part of that group, and I have to participate in this multi-way conversation, um, it's not as natural for me. After a while, I get tired uh, and, uh, and they usually disengage and either go aside with somebody to chat one-on-one -on -one or, or just, uh, just go out and do my thing on my own. <laughs> right. Um, what is your single biggest strength? I think there are a few things that I've been very fortunate with. Um, one of them is attitude towards life, um, a kind of adaptability and contentedness uh, with whatever situation I'm in. I generally tend to be happy. Um, more or less in, in whatever, whatever circumstances I'm in. And if I'm less happy, I, I basically reconfigure the situation uh, to get happy again. So it's very easy for me uh, to be happy, and I am generally happy. And I think that's mostly an internal thing actually. It's mostly uh, a matter probably of neurotransmitters and, and hormones and, and the chemistry of my brain and the chemistry of my body. And I think I just drew a lucky lottery ticket um, in that basically my internal thermostat is set on happy. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> Well, um, what is a recurring moral conflict? I don't think I have one. You know, most of my, what I do is work. I think my work is pretty good. Um, I think work, my work is generally good. I think technology is a good thing. I do technology. Hopefully I contribute to moving it forward. Um, I think technology is, by and large, uh, a force for good, uh, a force for uh, improvement in, uh, in people's living, living conditions. Um, so actually, I'm, I'm pretty good with in, in, that, in that regard. Yeah, back to the thermostat being set at happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there a specific instance where you distinctly recall feeling privileged? Well, I think I'm grateful for many things. Um, probably the biggest that comes to mind is uh, my family, uh, the culture that I come from, my upbringing. Now, I should probably explain first, in what ways I may not be quote unquote privileged, I may not come from a quote unquote privileged background. Um, I do not come from wealth. Um, I do not come from good material circumstances. And I do not come from an elite class in society that uh, was uh, treated preferentially. Uh, so I grew up in a poor to lower middle class uh, family uh, of Jewish intellectuals in Ukraine, in the former Soviet Union. Now, if there's something you're going to be, 
in Ukraine, in the former Soviet Union, being Jewish is not the best thing you can be. Uh, there was serious discrimination. There was uh, serious anti-Semitism. Um, and you can read uh, memoirs by Soviet scientists and mathematicians, uh, by Soviet Jewish scientists and mathematicians that describe these circumstances in detail. It was very clear that there were certain positions that you could not hold as a Jewish person. There were certain stations in society that you will never occupy uh, as a Jewish person. And uh, generally you will be your entire life uh, swimming upstream. You will be in your entire life swimming against the current and you are in a society that in various ways is not welcoming. And, and it, was, it was very clear that it permeated everything. Okay. And even within this set of people, this group of people, of, of Jewish intellectuals, my family was not wealthy. My family was not well-to-do. I think we were sort of below the mean uh, in, in various metrics, even among sort of Jewish people in, uh, in the, Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union. I was raised by a single mother. Uh, my father was never a part of my life. Um, my mother always had to work, as far as I remember, at least two jobs uh, to uh, sustain us. Uh, she was mostly gone because she was working, or when she wasn't working, she would often take uh, evening courses to get additional accreditation so that she could get a better job, so that she could somehow raise our uh, living conditions. So it was not a childhood of quote unquote privilege, all right? However, uh, it was a culture of, of books. It was a culture of knowledge. Uh, there was great respect for knowledge. There was great respect for education. And there was great respect for books. Uh, my grandfather was a book collector. He collected books. So there was this amazing library in the house of hundreds and hundreds of books. So oh. whatever he could save, uh, often to the chagrin of his family, uh, whatever he could squirrel away, he would use to buy books. And in fact, I have his book collection now. I have wow. inherited his book uh, collection after wow. he uh, passed away and uh, requested that it be shipped from Kiev, from Ukraine, uh, to, uh, um, uh, to the US. So I would just read. Uh, I would just read and read and read. Everybody was gone, everybody was working, and I was reading. Uh, and that was, that was very much encouraged. Uh, it was made very clear to me by my family uh, for as long as I can remember that I will get a graduate degree whether I like it or not. It was not my choice. I will get a graduate degree and that's it. Um, so, so that was uh, the culture. And there were other aspects to it that I think ended up being very, very beneficial. First, it is the attitude with which discrimination was greeted. There was no bitterness uh, that I noticed or that I can uh, remember. It was not a gloomy uh, atmosphere. Uh, gen uh, 
uh, it was very clear that we're discriminated against, but it was greeted with, with humor. Uh, the response was, uh, was a kind of joyous, humorous response. We would joke uh, about it. It was just our situation was, uh, was the subject of constant joking and, uh, and laughter. <laughs> The other aspect of it is that it was made clear to me um, that to uh, reach uh, a certain level of uh, comfort, uh, a certain level of well-being, I'm going to have to work much, much harder than other people because I, basically I was born with a handicap. I was born Jewish. And so to overcome this handicap, I'm just going to have to work so much harder. Hmm. And so uh, we developed uh, a very, very strong work ethic um, that in the Soviet Union, because we were swimming upstream, was necessary to just stay in place. I mean, you had to swim harder just to stay in place. Mm -hmm. But when we emigrated to Israel, turns out this combination of an incredibly strong work ethic and a positive, humorous, joyful attitude to life was, was like a jetpack. Uh, when there were no adversarial circumstances, turned out turns out that this is just a fantastic attitude uh, to life. And I think much of my success uh, is due to, uh, uh, to these, these attitudes and this cultural, uh, cultural background. Right, right. Thank you for sharing that. I feel like I had goosebumps multiple times um, in that story. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, what are you insecure about? I think I'm insecure about my uh, physical fitness, uh, the, my physical uh, shape. And I am in good shape, but it doesn't come naturally. Uh, I think that's also an aspect of my, uh, of my genetics. I, I don't think I'm naturally fit. Um, I am fit now, but that's because I work for it. And uh, to work for it, I have to will myself uh, to work for it, to work out uh, every, uh, every day. And I think that, you know, it comes from a place of, uh, of insecurity because if I don't work out for a few months, I look in the mirror and I don't like myself. Uh, it's, you know, it's not that the changes are dramatic, but, uh, but I can see and I don't feel, I don't feel as good um, about myself. And I basically, I have to work out, uh, to feel good about, uh, about myself again. Um, this is different from, uh, other things in life that I think are also very important, but just come effortlessly to me, like, like reading, for example. So I think reading a lot is also important, uh, to me but it just comes naturally. Uh, it's easy. I, I love doing it. Basically, if you just leave me to my own devices, I'll, I'll, I'll just start reading. That's what I do for fun. Uh, so that's important and it doesn't take any effort and it doesn't seem to be accompanied by any, uh, by any tension. But this physical fitness business uh, it is accompanied by tension, and I basically have to force myself to do it. Right. Um, do you feel like an imposter? No. Uh, so the most important thing to me is uh, is my work, uh, and with my work, I've been I've been very fortunate to uh, get some results during my PhD um, that that somehow due to the circumstances communicated to me that uh, I'm, I'm probably in the line, right line of work. I'm 
probably in the right business and uh and i and i seem to be reasonably good at this hmm. um what is something you're trying out these days and how is that going started grilling a lot hmm. uh probably many of us have uh, changed to some extent how we eat how we cook how we eat and what we eat this year uh due to uh, the coronavirus and and the associated lifestyle changes um one thing that happened for me is that i started grilling a lot regularly and uh i love it uh i i i love it it's it's very interesting there's this idea of, of the perfect steak that uh mere mortals like me uh will probably never attain in our lifetimes um but we can aspire to it we can gently asymptote towards the side and i'm having a lot of fun uh asymptoting <laughs> um what is your one favorite tool or trick or hack um that makes your life more convenient more efficient more fun there are a few um and i don't know if they're universal but they work uh they work for me one is getting up early um and having a few hours for uh clear focused work before i i get to email or uh, or meetings and so forth uh, i'm pretty sure that's not universal uh, some people uh, prefer the late time uh, and I, i don't think this is going to work for them um but it works it works for me um there are a few lists that i maintain that uh to me uh seem extremely useful um one of them is my reading list hmm. so uh what i do is if i uh see a paper a technical paper that i want to read um i simply add it to my reading list and i don't stress out if my reading list uh grows uh my reading list uh fluctuates in size um its longest it was it had more than 300 papers oh. in it and uh the backlog uh stretched back by more than 2 years oh. um right now my reading list has about 100 papers and it stretches back uh to may i think i'm almost done with may may meaning uh that's when i put the paper on the reading list not when the paper mm-hmm. was read some papers from a they're, they're from the 80s uh perhaps um and that's actually what i read in the morning so when i get up in the morning i will open my reading list and pick a paper from my reading list and uh um and i read mm-hmm. um that basically means that everything uh i've been interested in i will read uh it will not fall through the cracks i will get to it it may not be this month it may not be this year but i will get to it and i will read it uh that seems very very uh useful and because of the reading list i will always read the right thing when i start reading it's not going to be something something random it's something that i intentionally put on my reading list well the past me uh <laughs> the me from may 2020 uh, put uh put on my reading uh reading list right the other uh list that i maintain and that's in a in a somewhat different form is uh a list of ideas uh i maintain a folder uh with ideas and when um i have an idea that seems good let's say an idea for a project it usually is uh, an idea for a research project mm-hmm. i will write it up uh i will put a date on it i will create a new file uh in my ideas folder and uh i will write up the idea and that has a number of effects 
First of all, writing up an idea uh, usually uh, improves it. Uh, it crystallizes the idea, the, the act of writing it, even though I'm writing it for myself, mm -hmm. the idea becomes more concrete and more fleshed out uh, than just thinking it. So the act of writing uh, actually crystallizes the idea and usually uh, elaborates on it. I write more than I would have thought. And then um, in the future, when I get related ideas, I will expand on that idea in the same file. I will write additional aspects, additional improvements, so that maybe a year later or two years later or three years later, when the circumstances are right uh, and uh, I feel like the time is right and I have the right ingredients to act on this, I will often have pages upon pages upon pages uh, of notes for that idea and we can just hit the ground running. There are many aspects of the project that I already thought uh, thought through. And it was effortless because at any given time, it was maybe a quick note. I see a related data set. I go to this ideas uh, file, I write down, oh, here's a related data set. A month later, I see a related algorithm. I write down, oh, here's a related algorithm. Two years later, I have, an, uh, I have a file with 10 data sets, all the baselines, all the related work, and we can just execute on the project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds great. <laughs> um, what do you tend to think about most when you're not intentionally trying to think about something? Nothing in particular, and I don't find this stream of consciousness particularly interesting or meaningful. Um, basically, I don't take it seriously. Um, I think of it as roughly as rolling out an internal language model, an internal generative model. And to me, it, it has roughly the level of significance of, uh, of just rolling out a pre-trained uh, language model. Basically, I think this, this chatter uh, in our minds, well, at least in my mind, um, this, this chattering of the, of the idle mind, uh, it seems like a, like a maintenance function. Uh, basically, I, I don't think it's particularly interesting or insightful. Um, it seems to be doing something akin to uh, rehashing past experiences, rolling out possible futures, rolling out simulating possible variants uh, of past experiences how a past experience could have gone if, if a different decision uh, was made. And so it reminds me a bit of techniques that we use uh, to train uh, AI systems. It reminds me a bit of uh, experience replay and basically rolling out uh, a dynamics, an internal dynamics model for training. Um, that is uh, my closest model for what happens in the mind when it's idle. Um, and um, I basically don't find it particularly, uh, particularly interesting and don't take it uh, particularly, uh, particularly seriously. Mm. There is one circumstance uh, in which I found uh, these idle thoughts to lead to something useful. And that is a circumstance that I noticed and uh, do try to intentionally uh, recultivate and, and recreate. And that is that sometimes I, I get good ideas about my work. And since that's very important, uh, I tried to figure out when 
that is more likely to happen and whether I can increase the probability of it happening. And the circumstance in which uh, I can elicit this pretty reliably is when I'm in nature, uh, usually when I hike or generally when, when I'm in nature and I do not try to think about work. Uh, in fact, the most likely circumstance, uh, or at least what I uh, do to, uh, to, to, try to, uh, to try to create uh, this, is when I read up um, on, on a technical topic that I'm interested in, uh, on a challenging technical problem or a project, that I want to make progress on. I read up on it, I read up on it, I, I read up everything, I load all the raw material into my mind. And then I go on a hike and I do not think about it. I don't try to think about it. I enjoy the scenery. I let my mind relax and wander. And sometime during the hike, it just strikes me. I, I make progress. I get great ideas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what is something surprising about you? Something that the rest of us might not guess. I'm not very secretive. Uh, there aren't too many things that are surprising about me to me uh, or I guess to people who um, uh, know me not just through professional circles um, but I guess for people who just know me professionally I guess they might not know for example that I have a motorcycle uh, and that I've had it now for uh, 13 years, uh, and I love it. Uh, when I got it, you know, I think some people expected that this will pass. This is just a fad. But in fact, I, I really love it. Uh, I, I ride it regularly. I uh, often ride it to work uh, or to the gym uh, when, the weather, uh, when the weather is good. Um, in fact, I've had the same motorcycle for these uh, 13 years because at this point, just the sentimental value um, of, uh, of having the same motorcycle that I've been through so many interesting circumstances with, just accumulating all these diverse experiences with the same motorcycle makes this old motorcycle more valuable to me than uh, than the new motorcycle that would you know cost 10 times uh 10 times as much um so i i absolutely i absolutely love it so um what is one thing about the world that surprises you that life on a, on, a, on a grand scale, on a societal scale, uh, on the scale of civilization, uh, seems to get better over the long term. It seems that life over the long haul on a sufficiently large scale gets better. Uh, this has been documented um, many times. Uh, recently in, uh, in Steven Pinker's books, uh, like uh, The Better Angels of Our, Our Nature and Enlightenment Now. And, and the evidence is overwhelming, at least to me, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. It, it's clear uh, that there is a trend that on, on the whole, on a large scale, on long time scales, life gets better. Um, nowadays, even people who are lower middle class have 
things that a hundred years ago would have been considered not just luxuries, but magic. I mean, we routinely uh, deploy capabilities that a hundred years ago would have been regarded as magic. And that's just amazing. Uh, and our life spans, life expectancy, health, um, it's just amazing. So life gets better. Uh, it's, it gets better in part due to technological innovation. Uh, it seems to be a property uh, of the world and it seems very important. And to me, it's still a bit mysterious. Uh, I think to some extent, analytically, I understand it. I can trace it to some causal factors. But it still feels like maybe it didn't have to be this way. It, it is the way our world seems to be configured. But I can imagine, I think I can imagine other worlds. And we could have been living in one of those other worlds. And so it is very pleasantly surprising and still a little bit mysterious to me, uh, to some extent, that, that life does get better. Hmm. Um, what is one way in which um, you wish your life was different? Well, I wish physical fitness would come as naturally to me as, uh, as mental fitness. I, I wish going to the gym or working out uh, would, would, would be as effortless and obvious as, uh, as, as reading a good book. Right. Um, what are you looking forward to tomorrow or next week? More of the same, actually. I'm, I love my work. So I'm looking forward to doing more of it. I'm, I'm generally very happy with uh, each day and, uh, and each week. And I don't think there's going to be any, anything drastically different tomorrow or, or next week. But I'm looking forward to it. Um, when was the last time you danced? Last year. Last year. Um, what was your most recent dream that you remember? I don't remember my dreams. Uh, I know that they happen. Uh, I know both from studying uh, physiology uh, that I dream and because when I wake up, uh, very often there, there is kind of this memory of uh, just the last few seconds, just the, the present scene, the latest scene uh, of the dream. Hmm. Um, so I do dream, but I don't retain them. Um, and I, 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 I pretty much never did. Um, I don't remember what it was like in early childhood, but at least from middle childhood on, I noticed that I, I, I don't seem to retain my dreams. I don't seem to remember them. The way I noticed is that people were People asked, people were asking. Somehow it is a subject of uh, curiosity uh, uh, to people. Uh, my answer uh, was always, I, I don't remember. And I, I think as a child, I was too polite and confused to say, but now I'm, I'm, I'm not. I can say, I don't care. Um, I do not think that dreams, my dreams at least, are interesting. And I don't particularly care uh, what was there. The reason is that I regard it also as a maintenance function. Uh, you know, it is roughly the mental equivalent of uh, uh, whatever our digestive juices are doing, whatever the kidney does. Uh, now I don't particularly remember what the kidney does, but I roughly think of dreams as, rough, dreams to me have roughly that level of uh, I think it's some kind of mental, mental maintenance, mental consolidation. Uh, the internal generative model uh, is being rolled out. Some recent knowledge is being uh, consolidated into uh, 
uh, into longer term memory. Um, I don't particularly care. Yeah. Well, um, do you think there is a point to life, our, our existence? I'll give you two answers. On an individual level, I don't think there is a point to my life. I don't think there is a point to my existence. I don't think I am special. Uh, I don't think my life uh, has a purpose. My life as an individual, I think basically my life as an individual does not have a purpose and does not have meaning. And I think it's actually important, at least I find it important, uh, to um, retain um, what I regard as the proper level of humility. Uh, and I think it's, to me, important to remember that this is not about me. And if I were to disappear tomorrow, the world would be just fine. Uh, the world would move on and everything would be just fine without me. Okay. And to me, uh, that is an important part of keeping the proper attitude to life and maintaining a proper perspective on myself. However, I do think there are a couple of interesting things going on uh, that seem worth advancing, uh, preserving, and deepening. I think we understand the world. We understand the universe um, at a more advanced level uh, in some respects than any other creature, any other organism, any other physical phenomenon uh, that, that we've come across. We form abstractions and we uh, understand the, 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 the operation of the universe and the nature uh, of the universe at, at a level that, that, that seems unique and valuable. So to me, it seems good to contribute to this understanding. This understanding seems valuable and worthwhile. And so contributing to deepening, to advancing our understanding of the world, our understanding of, uh, of reality, that seems like a worthwhile uh, thing to do. The other um, capability that seems very interesting and, and unique and worth preserving and advancing is our ability to create artifacts, beautiful, complex artifacts. We create art we create complex and, and beautiful things. Um, and that also seems very worthwhile. It's, it again seems to be on a different level uh, from what um, other, other organisms are doing. Uh, we do create complex and beautiful things. And so to me, that also seems intrinsically good uh, to advance our ability to create complex and, uh, and beautiful things. Mm. Interesting. Um, what are two traits um, common across some of the best collaborators or colleagues you've worked with? Well, uh, the best collaborators or colleagues are smarter than me uh, and complement me. Uh, 
uh, in, in some ways. So uh, for particularly fruitful, uh, fruitful collaborations, um, these are people who are smarter than me. Uh, they're often technical, uh, very strong technically, and often strong in uh, technical aspects that I'm less strong in, uh, so that this is a good, uh, good collaboration and we complement each other and we reinforce each other. I also tend to work well with people who are pragmatic, um, who are not ideological, who are not advancing uh, a particular ideological agenda. So I really appreciate people who are very data-driven, who uh, primarily pay attention to data and experimental results, and are very flexible in uh, their thinking. Um, what I find, even with a lot of experience, is that reality continues to be very surprising. If you let yourself be surprised and if you perform experiments with an open mind and actually look at the data, your intuition will be broken pretty much on a weekly basis. Pretty much every week there is some experimental results uh, from some experiments that we do that uh, that, that breaks some of my intuition, that doesn't go the way I would have predicted. And uh, it is very important to me uh, to stay very open-minded, be very willing to revise my beliefs, but also be very willing to revise the project direction because the original conception uh, of the project that we start out with may just not be the best project uh, after some experimental results come back. And maybe we notice something interesting that we had no idea about, or maybe something that we thought was a good idea and in fact underpinned the, 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 the conception of the project, turns out to just not be a very good idea. Um, the way projects get in trouble and the way collaborations can get in trouble is if somebody becomes attached uh, to an idea that, uh, that, that just no longer seems uh, as compelling or, uh, or as consistent uh, with experimental results. And since I'm very flexible, um, I'm I'm, I basically have no qualms in just throwing out the old ideas, even last week's ideas, and just moving forward with whatever, whatever reality tells us. Mm -hmm. um, so the best collaborators uh, uh, for me basically have the same attitude, very pragmatic, very empirical, very data-driven. Got it, got it. Um, so we're just about running out of time. So is there anything else that you um, think we should have talked about, um, about you, your life, um, that you think we didn't cover? No, I think we're good. This was fun. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing it. Thanks for taking the time. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Lana. Yeah. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.